All right, greetings from the shores of Chesapeake Bay in Norfolk, Virginia. At the 45th Mayday Tribe reunion, I rewrote this Buck Owen song and performed it. For the 50th, I rewrote it again yesterday and today. Fresh, its debut. Here we go. They're gonna put us in the movies. Big, big stars of us, including me. Made a film a half century later. All we had to do was that naturally. Well, I bet you we'll all be big stars. Might win an Oscar, you can never tell. This movie's gonna make us some big stars, cause we played our parts so well. at the movies or see it streaming on a, or on a DVD with the biggest, bravest cast that's ever hit the big time and all we had to do is act naturally the scenes were shot in Washington, D.C. where we were all in the streets with our made tribe groups of affinity And all we had to do is act naturally Well, I bet you're gonna be big stars Might win an Oscar, hey, you can never tell That movie's gonna make us big stars Cause we could play our parts And we did so well Well, I hope you come see us in the movie. Maybe see it streamed or in a DVD. The Mayday Tribe's gonna hit the big time. And all we had to do was act naturally. Yeah, all we had to do was act radically. All we had to do was act revolutionarily. So that was Dave Potvin, who did a version of that song for a May Day reunion five years ago. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. We have people still, whoops, I got to turn off that. That's, that's, uh, I have to figure out how to get back to that. <laughs> All right. This is one of the joys of sharing that I can't quite. There. All right. <laughs> Why that's what comes up, I don't know. <laughs> you learn new things or screw up new things each time. Um, so the other thing that while we're now up to 101 people, I will share our uh, basic logo while I begin talking a little bit to uh, get us started. Um, I'm John McAuliffe. I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and also head a group called the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Um, the VPCC started Tom Hayden and David Courtright and I started it uh, by organizing against the Pentagon's version of the 50th anniversary of the war. And that led to a great conference in 2015, which is all on our online that if you've got a day or two to watch, I think you'd enjoy it. Um, and then after Tom's death, it, we reformed it, trying to figure out what it was in our own history that was important to lift up and at least get a record about um, and hopefully to share with people in newer generations. Uh, when COVID came along, we became a completely uh, virtual operation and have done now eight or 10 webinars uh, that are all listed on our site. 
Uh, we just did one on the People's Peace Treaty a couple of days ago. We'll do one tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock Eastern time, which is uh, about the day the war ended in Hanoi and Saigon with my own pictures from Hanoi and um, two people who were in Saigon at the same time, Nayan Chanda. Um, and um, now, of course, I'm blanking on I'm a friend from AFSC. But the, uh, the uh, I think you'll find that at least interesting. Um, the, then on May 15th, we'll be doing a remastered Sir No Sir will be offered free, followed by a panel discussion on June. And on June 13th, there will be a program on the 50th anniversary of the release of the Pentagon Papers. Um, so if you go on our website, you can find out about it, uh, vietnampeace.org, and everybody will get uh, oh, good. We're up to 120 of us now. Everybody uh, who registered will get a note tonight or tomorrow morning that uh, will give you links to the future programs, but also most useful. Um, all right, Judy, we're getting a second Judy Gumbo that doesn't look like Judy Gumbo. It ain't me, babe. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's not. Does anyone know? Oh, Bill Davis. I don't. Is that who that is? I don't know. Um. Any rate, I took that. So I don't know who that was. But <laughs> somebody came in under your name. Um, the joys of technology. Um, so, with that unintended delay. Um, so somebody named Bill Davis uh, somehow crashed into the system. Um, let me just say mechanically two other things. Uh, the chat will be closed until the discussion starts. I mean, it's that is closed for you to talk with each other. It's open if you wanna send a message to the panelists but it's not open uh, for communication with everybody. Um, and yes, Bert, eight is all you can see. This is a webinar, it's not a Zoom call. Um, so the Q&A, if you have a question, please use the Q&A to write that question. Um, if it's directed to a particular person, started out that way. Otherwise, just write the question and send it in. Uh, even once we open the chat, don't use it uh, for um, uh, the um, Q&A. Don't use the chat for Q&A. Just use it for contact among yourselves. I see. So Bill Davis is a friend of yours, Judy, that you gave your link to. That's, that's what to happened. My <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, he's saying it. Um, so any rate, we will go ahead and start. It's uh, May Day. I was a participant of uh, coming from Indiana at that point where I was doing alternative service, sort of. Um, and uh, several other people, everybody was more or less involved than I think. Um, but we're going to start out with the person who has chronicled the event, and if you haven't seen the book, you should certainly get a copy of it. Um, and that is Larry Roberts, so you're on. Well, thanks, John, and thanks to everyone in the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. You know, your group has been doing a lot of good work uh, to preserve and explicate this really important history of these times. So much of what we see in our politics and culture today has its roots in the conflict and the promise and the broken promises of the 60s and 70s. And perhaps studying those volatile times uh, can help us in our, in our current moment. 
And thanks to everybody for logging in this evening. I'm honored to share this panel with such distinguished writers and lawyers and filmmakers and activists. Um, I should begin by saying that in my case, I'm a journalist. And although I was a participant in that extraordinary 1971 May Day protest, that was, you know, that was really my last hurrah uh, as any kind of activist. I, I went in to become a reporter and an editor, and what drew me to journalism was the need to explain events, I guess, rather than to, to try to precipitate them. Why did I decide to spend years researching and writing about May Day? After all, it was just one of a thousand protests in Washington, D.C. But here's why it matters. Not only was May Day the finale of an intense season of protest in American history, I would argue that season was the most intense in DC up until last year's Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, but also in some ways it was the finale of the era that we call the 60s. So many of the forces and the people and the personalities and the issues of those days all converged on DC uh, in April and May of 1971. And I think the outcome really influenced the direction of the country. Certainly it helped sow the seeds of Richard Nixon's demise. And I've always been fascinated by how people in the middle of these hinge points in history uh, react. You know, leaders and ordinary people alike face choices. Uh, their principles and their moral compass gets tested. And this is important not only for those individuals, but in aggregate, the choices they make, the choices we all make, uh, often set the course for the whole country. What, ha what happened on May Day? For those of you who might not have followed it as closely as some of the rest of us. So the Vietnam anti-war movement had been around for about six years, almost as long as the American war in Vietnam. Um, Nixon's expansion of the fighting over the border into Laos in February of 71 infuriated students, church groups, peace groups, many veterans. So dozens of, group of these anti-war groups descended on the Capitol for a string of protests, um, beginning with the Vietnam veterans against the war. And the last action of this whole run of protests was May Day. Um, the idea was a blockade of the city streets and bridges by thousands of people who call themselves the May Day tribe. It was the largest act of mass civil disobedience the country had ever seen. And in response, Nixon militarized the city uh, and he unleashed the police riot squad, which swept up more than 12,000 people over three days. They stuffed every jail cell in the city, they filled the jail yards, and they put the overflow on a football field and inside the, the Washington Coliseum. And this is still the biggest mass arrest in American history. In the end, the courts ruled virtually every one of these arrests unconstitutional. And the government had to pay out millions of dollars in compensation to the prisoners for violating their rights. The people who joined the blockade didn't expect to lose their constitutional right of dissent when they went into the protest. But of course, they were hit, when they hit the streets, they figured there was a good chance they could end up in jail, right? Like many in the movement, they've come to, they've come to believe that the the tactics of the previous six years hadn't been strong enough to stop the war and that therefore more vigorous, a more vigorous protest was, was needed. I expect we'll hear more about this tactical choice from the next panelist, L.A. Kaufman, who has written a terrific book about that. But deciding to join May Day was the kind of a test of principles I was talking about earlier. If you felt the war was wrong, unethical, unwinnable, tearing the country apart, wasting lives and resources here and abroad, would you put your body on the line for that? Um, Tom Hayden, one of the leaders of the 60s and one of the founders of this, of this group that's sponsoring tonight's debate, he used, to, he used to describe this test, sort of a test of your existential commitment, the moral imperative to become an actor in history, not just a passive object. And that was certainly the case for the de facto leader of May Day, Rennie Davis. Rennie, who, as you know, died a few months ago, believed that the time was right for a mass act of civil disobedience against the war. 
Uh, and at first, not a lot of others agreed. So starting in the fall of 1970, he recruited a small group of activists, including some people on this panel, uh, to create momentum for a blockade of Washington. And through his efforts and those of others, in the end, 40,000 people, more than 40,000 people showed up uh, the weekend before May Day at the campground in DC. And that's astonishing. That's an astonishing organizing feat. You know, keep in mind, no cell phones, no internet, you know, everything done uh, you know, in an analog way through the mail and through telephones and through leaflets and bulletin boards and mimeograph machines. The moral test was different for those on the other side, right? Take Eagle Krogh, known as Bud Krogh. Bud was a young White House lawyer, a straight, honest man he was, but also a man eager to please his boss, Richard Nixon. And, and Bud took a harder, like many others in the White House, took a harder and harder line against the centers. And after May Day, Nixon was pleased by this, and he put Bud in charge of a group you may know called the White House Plumbers, and you know what happened next. Um, they went after Daniel Ellsberg and, and ultimately got caught in Watergate, and that was the end of, of, of Richard Nixon. Um, you know, Nixon himself also faced the choice, right? I mean, he, at the time of May Day, he feared he might not be reelected. His polls were very low. And the anti-war movement presented a political threat to him. He was a lawyer. Uh, he was a well-read man. Um, he knew well that he was breaking or bending, at best, the Constitution um, when he ordered these mass arrests. But, and he hid his real motive. You know, he, his real motive, I think, was self-preservation, but he dressed it up as a you know, law and order, preserving a law and, law and order. And I was also intrigued during my research by the, you know, the sort of choices facing the police chief of Washington, Jerry Wilson. Jerry, it turns out, was a man of integrity. He was a reformer of the police department. A lot of the things that he was doing to the department would be very familiar to the people who are calling for changes in the way cops do things now. Um, and, you know, the previous year before May Day, he became the first cop to ever win the Brotherhood Award from the National Conference of Christians and Jews, in part because he had handled the previous demonstrations, you know, in a fairly peaceful way. But here he was facing a direct order from his boss, uh, Nixon, and, and, and the people who worked for Nixon. He didn't think he had a choice but to sort of let loose the riot squad on the long-haired kids. Uh, and in the end, he paid the price. Jerry retired early, never got the big job he wanted to head up the FBI. So, you know, choices have consequences. Uh, we keep trying to learn these lessons, uh, and that's why I think it's worth studying May Day and the people who were there um, to this day. So thank you for listening. Uh, John, back hey, to you. Thank you very much, Sai. Um, our next speaker is L.A. Kaufman, whose book is Direct Action, Protest, and the Reinvention of American Radicalism. Um, we've posted on our blog her, the chapter about May Day. Uh, and I should say that if you look on, on the chat at the top of it, you'll see the link to the blog page, um, which has bios of all of the speakers. L.A. Thank you, John, um, and thank you to the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee for sponsoring this event and pulling together this remarkable collection of people. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and thank you, Larry, for the wonderful account you've written. Folks have not yet uh, read his book. I strongly encourage you. He's written uh, a beautifully researched and really gripping account of Mayday 71. Um, I'm in a bit of a different position, I think, from everyone else here in that I did not attend May Day 71. Um, I was still in elementary school. Um, and although I have been a grassroots organizer since the early 80s, uh, I am not uh, a spring chicken by any means, um, and was deeply involved in many forms of organizing and deeply interested in the history of organizing in the United States. It was not until 1999 that I even learned about May Day. 
uh, 71. Um, so uh, buried and forgotten has this event been. Um, I'd be interested to hear, to see, uh, you know, if any of our participants here tonight are people who've only recently learned about this event. Uh, I'm sure there are some folks who, who participated themselves and uh, know it inside out as some of our panelists do, but for other people, it's, it's, it's a remarkably um, overlooked event given how consequential it was um, at so many different levels, some of which Larry alluded to um, just now in his comments. Um, in my book, uh, Direct Action, so I learned, I learned about May Day 71 um, around the time of the Seattle WTO protests in 1999, which were very closely modeled on May Day um, in the sense that they used a similar decentralized organizing structure based on um, little units called affinity groups to plan a nonviolent disruptive shutdown of a major event. Um, in that case, it was the World Trade Organization meeting um, that was shut down in, in November 1999. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, so in my book, Direct Action, I explored the history of the protest, but also, uh, but, but seeing it very much as a turning point in the history of American activism, not just um, marking an end, the end of a certain kind of new left, as Larry alluded to, but as sowing the seeds for the kind of decentralized, multivocal, um, uh, multiracial, multicultural activism that we've seen in the generations since. Um, you know, it, at this moment, right now in 2021, when I think about the politics of of memory, of history, and and, and forgetting, um, I can't help think about as we are, you know, in, we hope beginning to come out of of this pandemic, um, about the 1918 Spanish flu as another um, kind of uh, traumatic event in U.S. history that it was largely forgotten. Um, many of us, you know, with this pandemic have revisited the history of the 1918 flu. And it's quite striking how these moments, these inflection points, these moments of great trauma in American history, how the cultural process of erasure works. And I think it's very uh, striking to think about 1971 and May Day as a, as a moment when, when we were on the verge of what felt like a total revolution, um, where the, the White House was shaken to the core by these protests, where the mass arrests um, uh, shocked and traumatized huge numbers of Americans to see the government send in the, the, the military and arrest, uh, conduct these mass sweep arrests. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I think quite a lot, I've been pondering quite a lot, um, the question of the January 6th insurrection that we, we all um, just lived through and how the process of erasing and rubbing off the, the, the sharpest edges of those memories is already underway. Um, you know, when I think about um, the lasting influences of, of May Day on the left, which I ex explored again at great length in my book, Direct Action, um, and I think about the protest movements of the Trump years. Um, in a sense, I think with the, it was almost with the inauguration of Trump, you see kind of the last, the last moments when people on the left are using this model that was developed in May Day. Um, there's another uh, very little known set of protests that happened during Trump's inauguration. If you remember those photos that showed the crowd and where you could see that the crowd, his small crowd, how it was mostly concentrated down at one end of, of the, the public area, that was because there were actually nonviolent blockades at all the other entrances around, um, organized by affinity groups, um, representing different kind of different segments of the pre-Trump left. There was a, you know, there was like a queer dance party at one, there was a feminist blockade at another, and there was Black Lives Matter at another. Um, but 
when we look at the totality of the protests that took place during the Trump era, which, um, well, first of all, I think we, we don't um, tend to recognize how much larger they were than anything that happened in the 60s, how we have seen a remarkable scaling up of activism um, in terms of total numbers, but uh, even more so in terms of the number of locations where protests take place. The Black Lives Matter uh, protests in the summer of 2020 um, happened in more than 3,000 towns and cities around the U.S., which is more than 10 times the number of locations where there were ever simultaneous protests happening against the Vietnam War, um, uh, even in, in 1970, when there was the, or either during the moratorium in 69 or in 1970. Um, so we've seen this kind of huge scaling up of protests. We've, we've lost um, some of the structural qualities that got handed down through the WTO protests and Occupy Wall Street and a, and a bunch of other movements in the interim. But one crucial respect in which um, May Day 71 marked a turning point that um, has remained definitive for protests on the left was that it was an emphatically nonviolent protest and that it marked a real turn away from the various forms of flirtation with violence um, that we saw in the American left uh, in the late violence, by, meaning violence against people. Um, Larry explores the question of the Capitol bombing and, and of course, the well-known um, but foiled uh, Weatherman plot uh, to, to, to to bomb Fort Dix, uh, which would have brought about uh, civilian casualties. But what we see, um, you know, at the time it was kind of unfashionable um, that, that, that May Day was such a nonviolent uh, protest. That was, that was a point of contention within the movement and it took some um, persuasion to build a broad consensus around this protest that was disruptive but nonviolent. Um, but that has held to this day. Um, the debates about the nature of nonviolence on the left over the last 50 years have exclusively been about whether or not property damage is violent. That's true all the way through the Black Lives Matter protests where you had you know, the burning of a police precinct perhaps, but you do not have armed people violently attacking others. Um, but we have to then, um, of course, think about the shadow of the January 6th insurrection and of the parallel history on the right. You know, there were memes that circulated right after January 6th, I don't know if any of you saw them, that were making analogies between the Capitol insurrection and say the um, the protests in the Wisconsin State House in 2011 that some of you may remember the occupation of that state house or the Kavanaugh protests when there were hundreds of people who were arrested in the Senate Hart Senate office building um, in a nonviolent disruption um, and uh, obviously those comparisons are completely uh, false uh, because of the great divide of violence versus nonviolence. Um, but I do, I do want us to sit with the discomfort that the January 6th insurrectionists may well have been saying to themselves, if the government won't stop the election, the people will stop the government. That they were seeking a violent disruption of government based on the big lie that persuaded them that what they were doing was right. Um, and I am not drawing easy analogies or saying that May Day 71 pr pr provided a model for them, but I do think that those of us who, who have come out of a tradition of disruptive disrupt direct action have something to sit with um, there, some discomfort to sit with. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying you know, to me, in a lot of ways, the hallmark of the grass, the massive sprawling grassroots left of the Trump years um, was the way in which led, uh, you know, particularly thanks to the leadership of women of color, whether it's AOC or Stacey Abrams, we saw not just massive street protests and street engagement, uh, which again was much larger than anything that happened in the late 60s or early 70s. Um, we just don't, don't talk about it that way. Um, but also a massive, massive re-engagement 
um, with electoral democracy, with voting rights, um, with kinds of activism that were considered a little unfashionable in certain segments of the left um, in previous eras. And um, so I'll leave us there um, just with, with these kind of resonances and echoes to ponder. Um, I don't think we have um, yet begun to, to fully comprehend the, the history that's you know, evolved around us over the last four years. Um, but one of the lessons of May Day 71 is that a protest that looks like a failure or a debacle at the time can often be influential in long-lasting ways. Let us hope that uh, when it comes to the January 6th insurrection, that um, the model is something different from May Day, where it seemed like it failed at first, and yet it led to far-reaching changes in accordance with the goals of the protest. Let us hope that with the January 6th insurrection, that that is not the outcome, um, but that rather that um, in holding that in our memory, um, we can turn away from that kind of violent attempt, white supremacist attempt to overthrow our government and continue with this progressive project of reclaiming and retaking the government. Don, I think you're muted. Yes, I had muted myself because uh, the dogs were barking. <laughs> Um, so at any rate, L.A., what I was saying is you might check your computer because uh, your picture kept jumping around and Zoom was warning us that your bandwidth, at least it was warning me that your bandwidth was inadequate. So if you can fool with that before you come back on into the discussion, that would be great. So the technology is never perfect. Um, Judy Gumbo is, is a friend from several projects now with BPCC and was very active in the organizing office stage in the preliminary stage of May Day. Uh, and you, again, you will see, uh, I reposted the link to the, um, uh, the list of speakers or the bios of speakers, and, but you can also go there afterwards. Judy. Um, uh, thank you. I um, welcome to everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. I was certainly a May Day activist. I was also a, a strong women's liberationist and a yippie. Uh, and I want to talk about two May Day events that most influenced my life. Hopefully you're getting this. Can, can everyone see this Fresh Wind Blows poster? Yes. Excellent. All right. So it's April 10th, 1971. I marched with 500 of my closest friends under a deep purple banner with the slogan Janis Joplin Brigade in honor of our movement's favorite woman rock band, now rock star now deceased. Um, no matter that we were small in number, we were a fresh wind that blew against a hated empire determined to disrupt racism and the war machine with which he curses uh, chants and yells. And this, in my mind, was actually the first May Day uh, action. I believe that the vets, if I'm correct about that, came after um, uh, the Fresh Wind demonstration. This is what we said. We are going to the Pentagon on April 10th to give serve notice to our enemies that women are moving against them. Our urgency and our fury at the expansion of the Indo-Chinese War and our rage at the repression of our black and brown sisters and brothers needs expression right now. So uh, like as, as LA said, we know that women's history is often sidelined or forgotten. At May Day, there were actually not one, but two women's marches. 
the relatively well-known April 10th march, and relatively is a real relative term here, and an, another less known march on May 2nd, three weeks later. Women had pulled that May 2nd march together just the day before. These women were met by a wall of riot police, but managed to break through and continued to protest in the streets, except for one. Abby Kaplan, who you can see right here, she's looking at the flag, not carrying it. Abby was a Barnard student. She was clubbed on the head and arrested. She died a few weeks later as a result of her injuries. Abby's was the single and perhaps the only death I attribute directly to police violence at May Day. Let's take a moment to remember our friend and comrade, Abby Kaplan. John, can we get back on me now? You're on, Judy. Okay. No, I see Jay. <laughs> well, it's because when he talks, he comes on. So that's why everybody should be muted. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. All right. So I arrived back in Washington, D.C. Uh, the two days before blocking traffic was scheduled to begin. That night, the Beach Boys played in front of somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 people. We don't know, I don't know because I was stoned and many of the people who were there were stoned. In his book, Larry has me stomping onto the stage, grabbing the mic from Mike Love and giving an impassioned speech about women's liberation. Given how stoned I was, I have no recollection of doing this. But if I'm the person who did, I'm proud of her. So by the time I awoke Sunday morning at the May, at the May Day, at a May Day house, DC police reprising Chicago 1968 and presaging future protests had stomped on tents and tear gassed concert goers. Sunday night, I once again smoked weed as did the rest of my affinity group. I had convinced myself I was leading by example. Demonstrators were to assemble at 6 a.m. Monday, May 3rd at previously designated intersections. My then boyfriend, not Stu, for those of you who knew Stu, tapped me on the shoulder at five. Let me sleep, I muttered. Are you sure? I'm sure, we'll get there in plenty of time. Judy Gumbo and her slackers reached our designated intersection around 8 a.m. Not a cop in sight, traffic flowed as freely as the Potomac River. My affinity group wandered off in search of protest. I did not follow. I walked DC's quiet streets alone, questioning how I dared to call myself a revolutionary after so forfeiting my act activist credentials. Others on this panel can tell you what occurred in the next three days of May Day. I cannot. I fled. I was not, as President Nixon called all May Day protesters, a dope addict but I did begin to question my yippee commitment to unfettered use of marijuana. Out of my self-hatred came a discipline I still practice. Use cannabis as medicine, smoke pot for relaxation, but don't inhale the strong stuff right before a major protest. So two months previously, Chicago White defendant Rennie Davis had invited me to Washington to help organize May Day. How could I refuse? On Monday, March 30, I heard the te a telephone ring. It was 19-year-old Leslie Bacon. Leslie and I had bonded over, guess what? Our mutual commitment to marijuana. Leslie said the weather underground had exploded a small bomb in the Capitol building. No one was killed or injured. A bathroom was destroyed, but Rennie was incensed. He and the majority of the May Day tribe immediately denounced the bombing. They rightly felt such an act undermined May Day's strategy of nonviolent civil di disobedience and would frighten protesters away. I was an outlier. Given my penchant at the time for extremism, combined with horrific destruction I was, I'd observed in Vietnam when I'd visited there the year before, my sympathies lay with it, not with Rennie, but with a David who had struck back at Goliath. For me, that bombing came to define the May Day period. Leslie, completely innocent, was arrested and held incommunicado by the FBI. My companions and I, and Colin Nyberger, if you hear you, Colin was one of them, we also were, we were also completely innocent and we left town. We didn't do it, but we, d we dug it, is how I explained my lack of involvement. Up to 400 activists, and me included, 
were subsequently subpoenaed to grand juries across the country. Eventually, our subpoenas were dropped to, as my FBI files reveal, avoid litigating the issue of electronic surveillance. But the FBI continued to surveil me without a warrant for four more years. FBI files also reveal a paranoid President Nixon who complains to HR Bob Haldeman, his White House Chief of Staff, that he could, that Nixon, he, Nixon, could not escalate the Vietnam War as he wished since if he did, he'd have demonstrators climbing over the White House fence to get him. I see now that Rennie was right. May Day may not have stopped the US government as he'd hoped, but May Day's nonviolent civil disobedience worked. We helped to stop an illegal immoral war and as protesters do today when we march in the, in the streets to confront death by racist cop. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, again, I keep going muting because our dogs have, of course, chosen this moment to make their presence felt. Um, our next speaker is a member of VPCC, Jay Craven. If you had the chance or take the opportunity, Jay created an incredible reading, international reading of Martin Luther King's Riverside Church speech, his sermon. Uh, beyond Vietnam, uh, which we have people from Vietnam and people from different places in the U.S., all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, reading sections of what's what, certainly one of Martin's most important speeches of his life and was given one year before he was assassinated, literally to the day. Um, so, Jay, Jay was an organizer for the People's Peace Treaty and for May Day. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little bit of my experience sort of leading up to May Day. I was in 19, April 1970 elected student body president at Boston University. So I first heard about May Day at the August National Student Association Congress at McAllister College, uh, where Rennie and John Freund blew into town to make the case for massive civil disobedience in Washington to disrupt business as usual. No one had heard about this prior to then. Um, there had been a meeting in Milwaukee where, where Rennie presented the idea it did not uh, fly, and so he was now trying it with the National Student Association. Fierce debate erupted over this proposal, but after the Cambodian invasion and the Kent and Jackson State shootings and the national student strike, many students wanted more than mass marches where you listen to speakers listen to speakers and go home. May Day seemed to be the right move at the right time to raise the cost of the war to the Nixon administration. The May Day resolution at NSA passed by a single vote, but was then forced into a recount by conservative students where it then lost by four votes. But the seed was planted, students wanted to commit civil disobedience in Washington. Also at the NSA Congress, President uh, Charlie Palmer reported that he had visited Saigon, where newly elected South Vietnamese student leaders proposed a people's peace treaty where students would search to, for co common agreement on terms to end the war, starting with a demand that the United States set a date for the total withdrawal of its troops. This peace treaty would involve student leaders from South Vietnam, North Vietnam, the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, and the United States. And this was a rare and possibly the only such joint call by all parties tied to the war. I was asked uh, to join the NSA delegation to Vietnam, where after being blocked from South Vietnam by the South Vietnamese government, the State Department, we slipped an undercover student, Doug Hostetter, into Saigon to produce the first draft of our peace treaty, which was then uh, sought after when Doug stopped in Laos on his way to join us in Hanoi. After I returned to the U.S., I worked full-time for the Peace Treaty and May Day all spring. I traveled solo across the country to meetings, teach-ins, rallies, spoke at the Winter Soldier investigation, worked on a film that was used as an organizing tool, testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about May Day and the war, and joined well-known progressives at their events Activists who were well known who joined our call for spring actions, including Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Dan Ellsberg, Noving Long, 
Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland, Vietnam veterans against the war. Out on the road, I stated an urgent case to stop Nixon's air war, the forced relocation of civilians, spraying of Agent Orange, the Operation Phoenix assassination program, the torture of South Vietnamese students and other dissidents in the tiger cages, invasions into Cambodia and Laos and more. The slogan, if the government won't stop the war, then we will stop the government, became our compelling call to unconventional action. For May Day, innovative strategies were put in motion. Each region of the US was asked to develop a network of affinity groups to plan their own Washington actions. A tactical manual offered maps for targets of civil disobedience actions and guidelines for nonviolent training. May Day was not a trashing spree. Protesters took risks, put their bodies on the line and showed imagination. This was a militant, nonviolent action to go to the edge of power, stare it straight in the face and confront it directly. The result was widespread disruption through mobile teams of affinity groups on May 3rd, then two more days of actions at the Justice Department and Capitol building. Nearly 13,000 people were arrested for the largest mass arrest in US history. I believe May Day had many impacts. It led to a more decentralized re regional leadership in the movement and civil disobedience actions at military and war related corporate sites around the country soon after. It also powered the next generations against nuclear power, US interventions in Central America, globalized trade and in support of ACT UP and AIDS activism. May Day revealed weaknesses in the anti-war movement for sure, especially its lack of diversity, its, reliant on celebrity, its reliance on celebrity leaders and its inexcusable lack of women in leadership positions. Women responded. And today women lead Black Lives Matter, action on climate change, voting rights, civil rights, and much more. Lessons were learned, I believe. May Day rattled Nixon and created a crisis environment and, and overreaction inside his White House that led to its own collapse. Kissinger, Haldeman, CIA Director, CIA Director Richard Helms all spoke of May Day's potency and influence. This was part of our success and only 79 of nearly 13,000 arrests held up in court. And White House overreach and corruption extended to the creation of Nixon's plumbers uh, that Larry was talking about earlier that were established just two months later after May Day to conduct illegal disruption, sabotage and cover-ups at Watergate, Ellsberg psychiatrist's office, anti-war offices and others to say nothing of Nixon's shakedown of $60 million in corporate money to pay for all this. May Day accelerated Nixon's downfall, forced him to show his hand, and his defeat created space and open doors to meaningful reforms like the 1973 War Powers Act that made future interventions more difficult, although far from perfect, and the 1975 church hearings that reigned in political assassinations and other government criminality. There's another May Day act impact we've seen in the emails that we've received this week. May Day triggered catharsis, and new kinds of activism for many participants. Bill Zimmerman, who's here today, is one good example. He saw problems with May Day, but this caused him to start medical aid for Indochina and much more. May Day moved me toward a lifelong commitment of community-based activism in progressive education, the arts, and film. Finally, our May Day spring offensive, including Dewey Canyon 3 and the mass mobilization, the people's lobby, curbed White House ability to expand and continue the war. Longtime New York Times writer Tad Schultz in his exhaustive history published in Foreign Affairs of the secret peace talks between Kissinger and Ladock Toe reveals how on April 29th, just four days before May Day, Nixon stated unequivocally that he would under no circumstances discuss a date certain for total withdrawal of US troops as a precondition for releasing US POWs. But at the very next meeting on March, on May 31st, Kissinger announced without conditions that the US would set a date for total withdrawal. And at the following meeting, he added that Nixon would no longer demand removal of North Vietnamese forces from South Vietnam and would agree to discuss reparations to Vietnam. There were, these were substantial breakthroughs. The only remaining obstacle was Nixon's support to South Vietnam's corrupt Thieu regime owing to the huge political debt that Nixon owed Thieu 
for withdrawing South Vietnam from the Paris peace talks at Nixon's request during the summer of 1968 campaign to sabotage LBJ's late game peace initiative. Chu had Nixon under his thumb and this remained a problem through the 1973 agreements and beyond. Who might have blown that Nixon scheme apart and ended the war sooner? Maybe press coverage or Congress, neither of whom acted. There's more to say, but Republican governments across the country in the wake of the successful Black Lives Matter protests are now taking aggressive actions to increase penalties to curb protest, with 90 bills currently introduced in 30 states. May Day's legacy requires that we act to prevent these new encroachments on democracy and the call to action. Thanks, thanks very much, Jay. Um, so we're gonna now go to a different dimension of May Day, which is, it's been noted how many people were arrested, 12,000. Um, I was among them in the first morning. We came from Indiana, a group, and we went to an intersection. And I would say probably within 15 minutes, we were all on buses with having been detained and taken to the Coliseum. There's a lovely picture of the Coliseum on our blog page. I think I still have the army blanket that they gave us at that point, as well as terrible bologna and cheese sandwiches. Um, but I was never charged with anything. I never processed through. So I'm sure somewhere in my files, there is a note that I was there and, and, and held, but as far as I know, there's no official record of it. Uh, and there were a whole of my, the person who I later married, Tina Bristol was with me at that point and she was in the same situation. The lawyers uh, had a, a uh, interesting challenge and were set a pattern that has become very important in later years. Phil Hirschkopf was one of the key leaders of of that effort, Phil. Thank you. For me to understand May Day, I have to go back with a little bit of history because May Day was the crescendo, it was the end demonstration to many demonstration watching over a six year period preceding it. Uh, in 1965, I was a year out of law school. I got a call from Bill Kunstler, a great civil rights lawyer. Would I go and represent some people who are gonna march from the Pentagon to the Capitol. Uh, I did so, I met David Dellinger, became a, a friend for many years and a client, I represented him several times getting out of jail. And Staunton, Lind and Bob Paris had led the march and the Nazi threw some red paint on him and that ended up being a Life magazine cover. They looked like they were covered in blood. Um, and from there I sort of became the counsel to the peace demonstrations. I think I represented every major peace demonstration except the moratorium in that six year period, negotiated the permits with Rennie Davis and with Dave Dellinger most of the time. Occasionally other people, uh, Ron Young would be present. During the years between say 65 and 67, 68, I did a lot of representation of the Berrigan brothers and individuals coming in. The Catholic movement was very active then. Uh, Armies of the Night, it was the Pentagon demonstration. I recommend the book to everybody. If you want to see what it was like inside a demonstration, what people were talking about, through the jaundiced eyes of uh, Norman Mailer, but it's worth the reading. Um, the next big demonstration was January 69, when they had the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, counter inauguration. Um, and now there was a lot of brutality in that. There was a lot of beatings along Independence Avenue there, but people for the first time took more part in the demonstration. Most of our demonstrations were some very noted people, Ben Spock or Weiss, a lot of people you haven't heard of, well, you heard of Ben Spock probably, but they led the march and then they talked to the press. People marched behind them and then they went home. They, they were demonstrators, they showed their support they weren't that active in the demonstration. Um, in 1969, October, 
the moratorium, this was basically yuppies and middle, more middle class people we've seen in other demonstrations, held a very large march. It was very peaceful, very few arrests. Uh, I was away when I got back. I helped them with the people who were in jail. But then in November 69, it was the one demonstration that was most significant aside from May Day. We had the March Against Death. And the March Against Death was a single file march from the area of the cemetery, the Arlington Cemetery, to the Capitol. It lasted all night long. Staunton Lynn led it. Each person had a candle and a name of a dead person from their state who died in Vietnam around their neck. And it involved the individuals very much in that. And then uh, the next day or two days later was, uh, I think, probably the biggest march I've ever seen in Washington. In my opinion, it's the biggest march they ever had in Washington. It's, it's, it was massive. It was hard to count. And it was one they fought over about who was there and who wasn't there. And from that, I went on representative DC nine. They, while the Chicago stuff was going on, we had nine priests and nuns and one lay person uh, who poured blood in the Dow chemical files, which was a very celebrated trial that was leading up though. And in, in February, 1970, March of 1970, I was representing whether underground people, they had taken over the Sino-Soviet Institute in Washington, DC. But we saw a buildup. The next really significant event to me, and I'm skipping a lot of little demonstrations, there isn't time to go into all those, was the ellipse. After Kent State and Cambodia, we had our first demonstration, the ellipse, the large area behind the White House. The only time it was ever really a massive demonstration on that plot of ground, so close to the White House. And that was the first time the people were really, really involved in the demonstration both the night before and the night after, people sat around in groups with Dick Fernandez, with Stuart Meacham. These were, these were wonderful leaders of many of the demonstrations and with Rennie and Dave Dellinger. They were always there, except when David was away sometimes. But that ellipse demonstration to me is the keynote that takes us into May Day. And the May Day itself is more than just that one day when people came in and they tried to block traffic and tried to shut down the government. They in fact did shut down the government. It wasn't a failure because they shut down the courts. And when you shut down the court system, at least in DC, you basically have shut down the government. Uh, no one really understood how well they shut down the courts. When I was called to be first involved in 1965, I had been in Mississippi the summer before representing SNCC kids and uh, people who were arrested in mass demonstrations. There weren't others around who had that kind of experience. Mine was very limited. I wasn't at a law school very much. But over these years, working with Sheila, you'll hear from next, Sheila O'Donnell, uh, we built up the techniques to represent massive amount of people, how to shut down one courtroom if you had a bad judge, while the volunteers shepherded people into other courtrooms, we had decent judges, how to negotiate for thousands of people with test cases, how to negotiate for thousands of people to be released by collateral and negotiating the amount of collateral with the threat, shutting down the courts if they didn't do it. And it was a massive problem because they couldn't identify with that many people. They didn't know who they had. They couldn't find people. Uh, there was a massive problem about health. People were getting ill that held there. But May Day brought everyone together. The VVAW, the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, demonstrated. They were at the Supreme Court. They were at the uh, Veterans Affairs place. The uh, Poor People's Campaign come in, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It's the first major real involvement we had of uh, the African-American community in these mass demonstrations. The Women Strike for Peace, chaining themselves to the uh, fence in front of the White House, and numerous other groups converged. May Day brought the people out. When the uh, forces, the, the basically the park police, went in and drove the people out of the campsites the Sunday night before the first sitting, uh, they disrupted the plans that Rennie and David had and the others had for what was going to happen. On the other hand, they, people went to DC and they're having their own demonstrations. In small groups getting together and saying, we've got to do this. They were no longer sheep being led. 
And uh, there was a lot happening after that, much too much to go into. I left May Day with a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Uh, I didn't think it was any fair along the way. I, uh, during, during the peace demonstrations, I had argued the Loving case in the U.S. Supreme Court and numerous other constitutional cases. People ask me over the 55 years I've practiced law and a lot of famous cases, a lot of well-known cases, what was my famous, what, what was my favorite, what was the most accomplished? And I tell them the greatest thing I ever did with my law degree was representing demonstrators, however much I may have contributed in, in the peace demonstrations, because we, we, we made democracy work. We ended a war with the voice of people in the streets. And it, it was a marvelous experience. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, Sheila, I'm gonna go quickly to you because on top of dogs, we have somebody outside with a piece of equipment making noise. So take it from here. Sheila is a private investigator, uh, has now retired, but was very involved in the legal support work for the demonstration. I arrived in 1969 and went immediately to the new MOB office and ended up <clears throat> when they learned I could type and they figured out that I was reliable, they gave, they suggested to Phil that I interview with him and we agreed to work together. But I came as a Kennedy liberal thinking when the war was over, we were good because the civil rights organization had taken care of racism and now here we go. So Phil, really showed me how to organize the office and to put it together based on what he learned out of Mississippi and the civil rights organizers. So I, I was in an office uh, in the new, in the, at 1029 Vermont and our offices were separated from the movement organizations just so that we had some security. I, um, I, had, I was in the office a few weeks before the demonstration started I used to call every lawyer in the, in the phone book to get them lined up. By May Day, of course, I had a list and I could go to the more reliable people, but we had a huge number of lawyers waiting to do work if they needed to. Phil was on the street with eight uh, law students and I suppose young lawyers, I'm not sure where they were within their thing during May Day. And they were all, they all had police passes. They had walkie talkies. I had a walkie talkie in my office and the, um, they were on the street. We had marshals on the street. We also had observers on the street. And those were the days when there were no, you know, I gave out rolls of dimes like candy to all these people asking them to call in to us to report police abuse or arrests, whatever they were seeing. Um, our people were very clear that we were not cops. We were not gonna stop people from doing whatever they wanted to do, but would advise them if they did this, they may get busted. The other thing I did prior to the demo was create a packet of information that went to all of our observers and all of our lawyers. That was a list of laws that may be broken, all the, all the hospitals and directions to them. Uh, the jails where we where people might get and I remember somehow I don't think anybody got there but we had a skating rink that they talked about putting people into um, and I um, so I just kind of ran riot control from inside the office I never got on the street until uh, yeah I just never got on the street because I was in there doing all the work that needed to be done I had a team of about 10 or 15 uh, students answering telephones coming to me with problems if they existed. And once the police rioted and arrested all those people during May Day, I started getting the phone calls from the lockups. And all I could tell people to do is, look, we don't know what's happening, but there's bail solidarity. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to tell them where you come from or what you're doing. Keep your, you know, if you feel like it, don't talk. And if we overwhelm the courts, they cannot they, they, have to, they have to do something other than process you through and release you. So, and we, we knew there were people in the mix who, who should not have been you know, collected by the police and didn't want to get arrested, but the police just scooped anybody up on the street. 
Um, so when, when it came time to feed all these prisoners, the word went out that there was no, there was no food. So the local churches got their church ladies to get out there with their food. The local demonstration community organized and they got their bologna and processed cheese sandwiches and white bread. And they added boxes of raisins into which they inserted rolled joints for the prisoners. So, you know, everybody was pretty happy about that. Um, and very happy to hear how many people were being arrested. Uh, or had been arrested. Um, one of the other things that I loved about the May Day demonstrations is one of our uh, friends, Brent Dillingham, who's now gone, uh, found a law saying that sheep had the right of way over the 14th Street Bridge. So he went out to Maryland to try to rent a herd of sheep, but it turned out that the FBI beat him to it. Obviously, they were watching us. They knew that that's what he intended to do. Um, the, um, generally, I will say that, um, well, I will say absolutely that May Day was a very big moment in my life. I learned my investigative tree. I, I was always very conscious of security. My home was a place where security was uppermost. But when I joined the anti-war movement and came to find out what was going on and how things were being, how, how the FBI was treating us, how the police were treating us, um, uh, I, you know, I, I sort of, I, I kind of came to, and Phil showed me really how to organize and how to prepare. And then I began to get calls from reporters and uh, lawyers around saying, could you do one thing for me and don't tell them that, you know, you're asking questions because I want the information. Don't tell them it's the Washington Post. So I figured, oh, I could probably make a living doing this. And I joined a law firm and learned that what was needed for criminal cases or for trial preparation. And that's what I did for most of my 45 years. And it was all out of the anti-war movement. It totally uh, informed my life and still informs my life. I still, I still think we were terrific. And I'm very glad about that. And I'm really happy to see this being done. Thank you to those of us who organized it. Thank you, Sheila. Phil, when you look, get a chance to look at the Q&A, you'll see that somebody has thanked you, who was a person who was arrested on the Capitol steps and uh, was part of the ACLU May Day case. So, uh, uh, Abby Ginsburg. So uh, you could catch up with her afterwards. Um, so our last speaker um, is Bill Zimmerman. Bill is, is the one of us who has been in the spotlight of the media history, of recent history of the anti-war movement in the Burns Novick series. And we thought we wanted to give him a chance to actually say what he wanted to say. Bill. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. I think John has saved me for last uh, because I probably have a somewhat more contrarian view of May Day uh, than many of the other panelists. Uh, I, or I spent four months organizing and recruiting for May Day using the materials that Jay described earlier. Uh, and somewhere in the middle of that period, Rennie asked me to be the coordinator of the Illinois delegation, which uh, I did. I had two reasons uh, for being involved with May Day. The first was that we had been trying to stop the war for the previous six years with no success. And I thought, as many others did, that it was time to escalate the tactics of the anti-war movement. The other reason I had for participating was that as a revolutionary at the time, I wanted tens of thousands of people to have the experience of committing nonviolent civil disobedience on the streets because I thought that if we were serious about transforming the country in a radical direction, we would need people with that experience. And I thought that he made a tactic and strategy was brilliant because it was capable of achieving both of those purposes simultaneously. 
I also assumed that we could attract something like 250,000 people. That was a reasonable assumption based on previous turnout for major anti-war demonstrations in which we had recruited that number and, and many more for several. Um, and I thought also that that number would be required to effectively deploy the tactic that we had developed of stopping the government by blocking traffic in DC. Unfortunately, when we hit the streets Monday morning, there were only about 20,000 of us. And the tactic immediately failed for lack of support. We were crushed by law enforcement. And by 1030 or 11, traffic was flowing everywhere in the city. So when it was over, uh, John Freund and I got together and began a postmortem. Where did we go wrong? Why didn't this work? And the first thing we addressed were, was the two goals that we shared, stopping the war and transforming society. Given the low turnout and given where we were at in US history at the time, our ability to, ra to radically transform American society increasingly appeared to be a mirage. On the other hand, the ability to stop the war became much more of a reality at that time. Public opinion polling conducted during May Day showed that for the first time, a majority of Americans favored withdrawal from Vietnam. A month and a half after May Day, that number increased when the Pentagon Papers were released. Yet, despite the increasing number of people opposed to the war, the anti-war movement itself wasn't growing, wasn't getting bigger. When John and I thought about why that was happening, we realized that the tactics that we were projecting, especially uh, the tactics of May Day, were seen by mainstream Americans as involving the risk of arrest or injury. That is, they thought if they participated with us, they would have to expose themselves to that risk and they were reluctant to do so. So the anti-war movement was not growing and we felt that the movement needed a change in strategy. It needed to enter a new stage and develop organizations and tactics that would bring people in, that would be attractive in terms of mainstream people participating, rather than pushing those people away with militant tactics that they were not ready to accept. And indeed in the months that followed May Day, new organizations came into existence that provided just the, those tactics and changed the nature of the anti-war movement uh, beginning in the fall uh, and early winter of 72. And the new organizations I'm talking about are the Indochina Peace Campaign, Medical Aid for Indochina, the Indochina Resource Center, uh, as well as some of the older organizations like AFSC and CALC who were newly empowered as a result of this mainstream strategy. All of these groups through their work in the year and a half following May Day culminated in an increasingly large change in terms of public opinion in the country that eventually led a year and a half after May Day to the signing of the Paris Peace Accords and the withdrawal of all US military forces from Vietnam. At that point, the same organization as I'm referring to coalesced into the coalition to stop funding the war and spent the next two years lobbying to cut off congressional funding that was going to support the military regime in South Vietnam. After two years, that grassroots lobbying effort succeeded and sufficient funds were cut off uh, on our side 
such that the South Vietnamese military ran out of fuel, ammunition, uh, and supplies and collapsed in the face of a North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese offensive that finally succeeded on April 30th, 1975, when it rolled into Saigon and crashed through the gates of the presidential palace. So I believe, unlike some of the other panelists, that May Day was in fact a major turning point in the anti-war movement. But it was a turning point, not because it succeeded in its tactics and strategy, but because it failed. And that failure led us to pursue the only success that we could realistically hope to achieve at that time. Now, I also want to say that while some have argued that May Day succeeded in preventing future escalations. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case either. A major escalation occurred a year after May Day when Nixon and Kissinger mined the harbor of Haiphong in April 72 and began carpet bombing the cities of North Vietnam. The second escalation occurred in December of 72 when they carpet bombed Hanoi uh, in December, the so-called Christmas bombing. And among the many targets destroyed in the city was the Bach Mai Hospital, the country's largest civilian medical facility. The destruction of the hospital and the Christmas bombing then led to one of the most dramatic and effective anti-war protests in the history uh, of the movement. And that was a very well-publicized campaign to rebuild the Bach Mai Hospital, which had just been destroyed by American bombs with American dollars that we would raise uh, and use to rebuild this, this hospital. That campaign uh, not only succeeded in arousing massive attention and support, but two weeks after it was launched, the Paris Peace Accords were signed. So the shift in strategy that occurred as a result of the failure of May Day, ultimately, in my view, helped end the war by forcing the anti-war movement to shift from a period of radicalism and extremism to an attempt to control mainstream opinion and focus it on the US Congress. And that was successfully achieved. John. Thank you, Bill. Um, there are several reasons that I wanted Bill to participate in this, uh, besides the fact that he's somebody I've known and admired for a number of years, but and that it sets a different, somewhat different parameter on this discussion. But also it's the parameter for the next two and a half years of the PCC work or three years of VPCC work as we try to grapple with the final stage of the anti-war movement, which was is seldom discussed as a stage in the anti-war movement. So I appreciate that, that opening. Um, we're gonna take a while, at least 10 minutes for conversation among the panelists, um, either responding to Bill's point or the question that LA raised earlier about the comparisons and differences of January 6th. Um, somebody sent us a note saying it was, we were insurrectionists just like January 6th, uh, but we were good insurrectionists. So uh, there's different spins of the comparison that people no doubt have. And then after that, there are a few more people that are in the audience who are very involved in May Day who I'm, I'm gonna bring in as uh, we've called them cameos uh, as they will have a chance to say a few more minutes about what they experienced and what their involvement was. But is there anybody um, amongst the panelists who would now like to speak? And you just really have to raise your, your hands um, and, or you can unmute yourself and start talking, whatever it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd be curious, I'd be curious to hear what Larry has to say. I'm happy to talk, to mention a few things too. Or LA as well. She's back with us, I see. what they have to say about yeah what they maybe how they respond to bill i mean I, I i'm happy to offer a couple comments maybe i should start it off i mean i think that what bill describes in terms of the activity that followed may day was indeed important in a lot of the ways that he says my, my feeling is that may day was was the right action at that particular moment and that it did have impact to push the uh anti-war focus in in a new direction and that it also had an impact in terms of allowing Nixon, who, because it did rattle and um, sort of panic the Nixon White House, both in terms of the upcoming election and subsequent overreach that sort of, you know, torpedoed his administration, uh, that it also resulted in turning a very important corner in terms of negotiated settlement that did need final resolution, uh, as Bill suggests, in terms of finally defunding the Chu administration. But, uh, you know, I do believe that, that at, at the time and the place, uh, it was the right thing to do. I think there was a generation of uh, students in particular, which was sort of my generation. We were a lot younger than, um, than Rennie and John and, and Bill and others. And for us who had been through the national student strike, the Kent State, uh, Jackson State shootings, et cetera, uh, and who had been sort of grown up on the moratorium, there was a very strong need to do something further to really bring civil disobedience into the conversation. I think even if you look at, uh, I mean, technically some of the shipments and the rebuilding of Bach Mai Hospital technically were acts of civil disobedience, weren't they? I mean, wasn't it illegal for Americans to participate in a financial uh, gesture of support uh, for that activity. So, you know, I think May Day ran its course for sure and was a turning point. We could have a whole long discussion about that. I feel it was the right event at the right time. Uh, and that I don't think that takes away anything from what Bill is saying. One of the early precedents in May Day, in a sense, never happened. Um, and that was the moratorium. Because remember, the moratorium started out saying, we're going to do it one day this month and then two days the next month and then three days the month after that and four days the month after that and it, there's this kind of general strike atmosphere to the moratorium and it had that kind of mass outreach that Bill was talking about um, and yet it stopped after the second month with, with the big demonstrations in Washington and on the west coast and it never quite, it never came back. There were some local moratorium things, but, but that idea um, of, of, in some ways, maybe they may have embodied some of it, but uh, it, was a, it was a different era. Uh, LA wanted to speak to this, but because of her, it, it, the stability of her internet, she will just be audio. So uh, you wanna come on? Yes, thanks, John. Um, actually, I do want to see if I can come on for one second because uh, let's see if I can come. On. Yeah, right up here. This poster is from the um, February fifteenth, two thousand and three, um, anti-war protest, which I was the mobilizing coordinator for with United for Peace and Justice. Um, and I'm going to go back off camera, but I point to it because I think the question of how you decide whether or not a protest is successful is a really complicated one. And I say this as someone who put a lot of uh, effort and passion into that protest, um, the, the uh, uh, Iraq anti-war protests of 2003, 2004, which um, in many respects can only be seen as, as failures um, and yet were necessary um, uh, counterweights uh, to the Bush administration's war drive. The Bush administration in that case was in a lot of ways fighting uh, leftover battles of Vietnam and seeking to, sh to demonstrate 
um, its indifference to protests in the street by the way that they responded to our what was um, at the time and still February 15, 2003 still stands as the largest single day of protest in world history um, ever. Um, so I think uh, I, I certainly hear um, the the kind of compelling evidence that that Bill is providing of of ways in which um, the movement turn uh, towards less divisive forms of, of lobbying and influence um, after May Day 71 um, seem to get greater traction. But I don't I don't think a protest has to be popular to be effective. Um, and it doesn't have to have been seen to have, um, it, it doesn't have to have given people the warm fuzzies to have gotten the results from the antagonists who were the target of that protest. And I think um, these, these judgments are very, very hard to make because it's a situation, it's sort of like the question of when you're, when you're looking at um, the estimates of turnout in a protest, right? All the sources are bad and unreliable ones who have a vested interest in life. The protest organizers have an interest in exaggerating the size of a crowd or the impact of what they did. The authorities have an interest in underestimating estimating the size of a crowd and the impact of what it did. Um, I, part of what I found uh, so wonderful about Larry's book is that he was able to access um, certain kinds of official sources who I at least had not heard from before uh, in his research um, to give us more of a spectrum of the sense of ways in which May Day 71 had impact. Um, but again, I think we're seeing, um, we're, we're living this now in that the, the Black Lives Matter protests of last year, although they were overwhelmingly peaceful, um, have not been overwhelmingly supportive. That does not mean that they are not effective and that, um, and when we gauge their effectiveness, we have to look not just at what happens um, in polling and what people say about them, but also what happens in terms of how institutions react. So I don't, I'm not uh, saying that to contradict Bill, but to, to add a layer of complexity. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to speak. Sure, Judy, let me just say something procedurally. I've opened up the chat so people can communicate with each other. If you see somebody on the list that you haven't seen for 40 years and you want to get in touch with them, go ahead. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you. I, I, I want to agree both um, uh, with, uh, our, with LA and with Jay. I think that in my experience, the May Day, despite that we didn't stop the government, May Day was successful. And for two reasons, on the personal level, I was one of the organizers of the 45th anniversary of May Day in Washington. And it was amazing and astounding and heart rending to hear the stories of people and what they went through positive, the positive experiences of people at May Day and especially the vets who were there. They were very pleased to be able to uh, have taken part in that, in that uh, not just the anniversary, but in May Day. And then when uh, Jay and I and Rennie and a bunch of other people visited Vietnam in uh, 2017, we heard from, I think, no, it was 2013, we heard from Madame Bin directly who told us how grateful she was for the activities of the anti-war movement. She said, I mean, that's exactly what she said. I'm very grateful to you and she was speaking to a, a small group, but to you for what you did to help stop the Vietnam War. And what to me that was, and I think probably for everyone else who, uh, on that delegation also, was a message, it wasn't just for us, it was every single person who was an anti-war activist actually earned the gratitude of the Vietnamese for helping stop the war. And that to me was something that May Day clearly did. And that's why I think it was a very uh, important event. Larry. You know, one of the things that's interesting when you research this period is this question Bill raises about cause and effect. You know, like all through the, all aspects of the anti-war movement, um, 
depending on where people were and how where they focused their energies, uh, there grew up this belief that they were the ones who made the most progress in ending the war. You know, we did this and it stopped the war. We did that and it stopped the war. Um, you know, I think the jury historically is still out on exactly what the you know specific cause and effect were. However, if you spend time, uh, as I did many, many hours listening to the Nixon tapes, a couple of things are clear. Um, you know, because he's speaking with Henry Kissinger, he's speaking with Haldeman, he's speaking with his political advisors. Um, you know, there's no question that the that the that the anti-war protests had a huge effect on Nixon. I'm sure they did on LBJ as well, but I'm speaking primarily about the Nixon administration. Uh, and, you know, number one, I don't think you can listen to the tapes and, and, and argue that the movement didn't constrain uh, the options, the military options that the administration had. Um, there were, as we know from, you know, lots of reporting, there was talk, uh, you know, in the Pentagon and in the White House about a much more, uh, you know, severe response, an invasion of North Vietnam, potentially even using tactical nuclear weapons on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was a lot of discussion about a massive escalation of the war because it was known within uh, the administration, within the military, that there was really no way for the United States to win uh, that war without a much more massive occupation and use of military force than had been deployed so far. So even by 1971, the trajectory inside the government was to withdraw from Vietnam, to end the war, to at some point pull out US troops. That was an unstoppable trajectory. And you know, the extent to which May Day itself accelerated it, the extent to which the Indochina peace campaign and the subsequent uh, activities that Bill talks about accelerated that or changed it, I don't know. Um, but there was no question that the war was coming to an end, that Congress wanted to pull out, that Congress wanted to pull out funds um, and uh, not support the South Vietnamese regime. And militarily, anyone who reads the uh, very good, you know, I'm not a military historian, but reading the the very good books that have been written, uh, you know, Max Hastings books and others about the war itself on the ground, um, there was never any way that the South Vietnamese regime was going to survive once the US pulled out troops, no matter how many, how much support was given to, um, you know, the government by Congress. So that trajectory was already, was already there. The extent to which the moratorium, which was huge, you know, May Day, um, and the subsequent, you know, in China peace campaign, Tom Hayden, Jane Fonda and others affected the timeline of all that. Um, I, I don't know, I leave that to others, but um, I don't think it's, I don't think there's any way we can, we know enough to say, you know, the moratorium only went so far, May Day only did so much, the subsequent uh, activities only did so much. Uh, I think Dewey Thank Canyon you. 3 by the vets was also extremely important that spring as part of the spring offensive. I think it really can't be underestimated the power of the Vietnam veterans against the war um, in, co in combination with all these other things. Anyway, let, me, let me pick up on that, Jay. I, I, I seriously disagree with Mr. Zimmerman. I completely disagree with him, actually. Uh, May Day wasn't a bunch of young people sitting down on the Memorial Bridge. May Day started with those Vietnam veterans throwing their medals over a fence and John Kerry testifying at the Congress. And that had enormous impact. And within a week of that, we had the second or third largest demonstration we ever had in the peace uh, actions, the NPAC demonstration on the West Lawn of the Capitol. I had to negotiate directly with Spiro Agnew to get that permit. It had never been done before. And that was anywhere between a third and a half million people there. And it was a lot of congressmen, a lot of senators were actually at that demonstration. And after that, with the Poor People's Campaign, it was the first time we got them that involved. The SCLC was a big impetus. We had problems getting into the African-American community with what we wanted to say about it. Uh, and then May Day itself, the arrests were horrendous. A lot of congressmen, People who worked in their staff were arrested. 
we, we had a case, APO Flower. It's one of the many arrests you heard of it. A young girl, a 20 feet from a police captain, threw a daisy in the street and say peace to him. And she was arrested on a serious felony of assault on a police officer, Dash Flower. Uh, and the day after all those horrendous arrests, which went to a lot of people in Congress, 2,000 people are arrested after they were herded into a street outside the Department of Justice. That got enormous publicity. And then that same day, they issued the uh, indictments of Rennie Davis, which we had quelched because we filed motions that they had been wiretapping us, the government and doing things. We knew they were doing it from other cases. And we went to the Court of Appeals and we blocked those grand juries. And then on the, the third day of May Day, 1,200 people arrested on the Capitol steps. And Ron Dellum was speaking. Bella Abs had just finished speaking. Uh, Perrin Mitchell was about to speak. Charlie Rangel was there. This is while four congressmen were addressing the crowd who invited them there. They'd been escorted there by the police. It got massive publicity. I dealt with a lot of congressmen, a lot of senators. In the course of these campaigns, I represented a number of them who joined in cases. And these events I just listed affected them more than anything I saw affect them. A lot of them became much more active in opposing this war. And it didn't end there. We then had a very major trial. It got massive national publicity for the 1,200 people arrested on the step. We tried for eight people, a week-long trial, a jury trial. Jury was out two hours because one of them had a birthday that I sent out for a birthday cake. But it got tremendous publicity. And after that, there was the damage trial. It was, it was two years later. It ended up settling. But that kept it for the public eye. It was massive, uh, great publicity for how the government had really taken over this thing in a horrible way. Uh, so I think in that way, I, and I was opposed to May Day, the, the May Day collective in terms of blocking the traffic. I think there's a chance the world ever shut the government down. They make grows a hell of a traffic jam. But what they did is what I said before. They shut down the courts. They shut down a major arm of the government. They made, and they brought the White House into their own pandemic at that time. And when you saw the, a lot of those bombings, that's because of the reaction to May Day. Uh, they got very desperate. Phil, one thing, I think you've conflated a lot of things together. And having been involved in a lot of the organizing discussions, uh, the people who were doing the Dewey Canyon demonstration did not see themselves. I mean, there were there are always people who were involved in everything, but they certainly saw themselves as being different than even the big mass mobilization on the weekend. And the big mass mobilization on the weekend, which was mostly NPAC, uh, mostly from the Trotskyist organizing, they certainly saw themselves as very different from May Day. So I think you're right in the sense of everything adds into everything else. And from the viewpoint of the attorneys dealing with the, the outflow from all of it or the effects of all of it. But it, within the psychology of the participants, they saw themselves as being, one, most of them saw themselves as being one thing or the other. Bill, do you wanna? Well, most groups didn't agree with the May Day collectives, you know, the right. thing, so. Bill. Go ahead, Bill, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, first off, let me stipulate that I certainly agree with everyone who has said the anti-war movement was a powerful influence uh, throughout its eight-year history on government policy. And certainly, without doubt, uh, it limited the military options available both to Johnson and to Nixon. Uh, I certainly agree that Dewey Canyon III was probably the most effective anti-war demonstration that had ever occurred. Uh, but movements like the anti-war movement are struggles between opposing forces. And what's at issue is the strategy and tactics used by each side. And when you go into a conflict 
uh, with another, with you're a force and you go into conflict with another force, you constantly have to evaluate the effectiveness of the strategy driving your actions and the tactics that you're using to further that strategy. And that's what I'm arguing for here. Um, protest is not an end in and of itself. Protest is about securing something from power. And movements for social change are about power. They're not about the ability to mount protests that have no impact on power. I mean, they sometimes become that out of default, but that's not what they're supposed to do. Movements are designed to change public policy. Uh, and if they fail to change public policy, you have to ask, well, is there a more effective strategy? Are there more effective tactics? Larry just made the point that there were a third of a million people that turned out for the trot demonstration a week before May Day. They got a third of a million and we got 20,000. You know, that tells me that we have to ask ourselves, how come? How come they got so many and we got so few? If we had had a third of a million people, there would have been 10 times 10,000 people arrested at May Day and Washington would have been shut down. The tactic would have worked and the movement would have gone forward probably by expanding on that tactic because it had succeeded. But it didn't succeed. We didn't recruit the numbers we needed. And instead of, uh, you know, sitting back and saying, well, it was a good time and we did the best we could, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. Why didn't we succeed? And I think that the anti-war movement collectively did ask those hard questions and did come to the conclusion that civil disobedience at that point as a strategy was not effective. And we had to back away, uh, not entirely. You know, Jay asked the question of, uh, wasn't rebuilding the Bachmai Hospital an act of civil disobedience? Well. Actually not, uh, Jay, because there was no declaration of war. Uh, the Congress threatened to arrest us uh, for violating the Trading with the Enemy Act. Uh, and, you know, if we sent another shipment and we responded by sending them the date, time and place of our next shipment and inviting them to come and arrest us if that's what they wanted to do because we knew there was no declaration of war and it wasn't legal. And if they did it anyway, no jury would convict us under those circumstances. So yeah, it was a small act of civil disobedience, but the people who would have been arrested were only the leadership uh, of the organization. It wasn't mass civil disobedience, which I think was the point you were trying to make. And the point I'm making now uh, in terms of it, of it having reached a point where it was no longer effective in terms of changing the power balance between the anti-war movement or not just the movement, but all of the anti-war forces in the country uh, between them and on the one hand and Nixon and Kissinger on the other. We, um, I want, yeah, uh, Sheila, you wanna be in on this conversation? Yes. Okay, I just, go ahead. And then I wanna bring Carol in, but go ahead. Yes, thanks. I just like to say a couple of things. It depends upon your analysis of success. When we had that meeting five years ago in DC, the uh, 45 year anniversary, every single one of our organizers had done altruistic work starting in the, their anti-war activism. I mean, it was very impressive to me. I was so touched that we all continued to that work the second thing is, is that all many, many of my friends who were participants on one level or another of the demos, that May Day really shifted all of their thinking. I think that's a success. And I think it's a success to see people do altruistic work. Plus, we had youth organizing. We had junior high school students and high school students and college students all working toward the same goal. 
Again, I think that's successful. And last but not least, Dan Ellsberg said, if it hadn't been for May Day, he would not have felt that he could release the Pentagon Papers. So, you know, not a major success. We didn't stop the war that, but during that May Day, but I, I would argue there was a lot of, there were a lot of successes in there. Thank you. Speaking of Dan Ellsberg, tomorrow and Saturday, um, there is a major conference at UMass Amherst, which if you get our newsletter, you can find it, or if you probably if you go to their website, or I'll send out a note about it, which is literally a two-day conference about the Pentagon Papers and their implications. And as I said, we're doing one ourselves on the actual anniversary on the 13th. I want to, we can come back to this discussion, but I before we're totally afield, I want to ask Carol Cullum to unmute herself and to add in the piece that hasn't been much talked about, which is the uh, People's Lobby. Carol. Hi, my name is Carol Cullum. I came to May Day at the request of Quaker activists from Pendle Hill and worked in the office of PCPJ and May Day. That whole experience changed my life. PCPJ favored a multi-issue approach to anti-war organizing and worked to build alliances with non-pacifist organizations like the NWRO, National Welfare Rights Organization, SCLC, drawing connections for, between the foreign and domestic policies of the United States. Are you trying to change this? Okay. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to um, have it go down. There, okay. okay, there you go. Okay. In virtually everything that went out to people across the country, we, we emphasized that massive one day demonstrations were not enough. More was ended to end, needed to end the war. PCP, PCPJ focused its efforts on a multi-day people's lobby which consisted of planned and coordinated sit-ins with nonviolent civil disobedience outside major government buildings. It was not supposed to do that. Hold on. <laughs> Here we go. The mule train opened the Poor People's March with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. In 1971, SCLC in the Poor People's Campaign brought the mule train back to Washington to begin this week-long people's lobby to end the war and bring adequate income demanded by NWRO. On Monday, April 26, thousands of demonstrators lobbied their representatives to end the war in Vietnam and demand they sign the People's Peace Treaty. This photo shows five members of May Day Collective testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to present the People's Peace Treaty and urge members to sign it and ratify it. On Tuesday, the 27th of April, hundreds of Vietnam vets and other activists sat in front of the Selective Service Headquarters attempting to stop the Selective Service machine and put an end to war. On Wednesday, April 28th, members of the War Resisters League and hundreds of others were arrested at the IRS. We demanded an end to our taxes being used to support the war. Thursday, April 29th, NWRO took the stage. The entrance to the HEW, HUD, Lever, and Agriculture were blocked by demonstrations. Members of NWRO, including President Johnny Tillman and Director George Wiley, organized marchers and sit-ins on Capitol Hill and throughout the U.S. to lobby Congress. At HEW, hundreds of welfare mothers and their children stormed the door and filled the auditorium. 
They've demanded not only a guaranteed annual income of 6,500, but they, an end to devastating war that was bringing so many of their children home in a coffin. On the 30th, thousands of demonstrators came to the Justice Department, demanding that they stop the illegal surveillance of thousands of people who opposed the war in Vietnam and to release all political prisoners. If you'll see in all of these, the police helped drag the employees over. A lot of people would not cross our line, which was really wonderful. People who came to demonstrate were committed to nonviolence and received training from Quaker activists around the country. Nonviolent trainers were able to train thousands of people in Washington between April 19th and May 5th. We were militant, but not, but nonviolent. On April 5th, after over 14,000 people were arrested, trying to block the streets and shut down Washington, we were still there taking action. We had a, a permit that was properly issued. We were invited by Congress to join them on the Capitol steps. Over 1,200 1, people gathered on the steps to listen to Representative Bella Abzug and Ron Dellums to speak with us. Then the police declared an illegal gathering, ignoring the speakers, ignoring the permit and the, and the invitation we received. They began beating people and making arrests. Ron Dellums approached one of the cops and told him to stop, told him he had invited us there. They didn't even recognize Congressman Dellums and the cops began violently assaulting him with their belly clubs, causing serious injuries to his ribs. Ron J Dellums, joined the hundreds of demonstrators over the past week that had received serious injuries at the hands of the police. We were arrested and taken to jail and then to the National Guard Armory. We were grateful to the numerous member, women of the black community in Washington, DC, who brought us food to eat at the armory and makeshift jails at the stadium. Dr. Spock was arrested and put in the uh, makeshift jail at the DC stadium. Okay. The ACLU, oh wait, the ACLU uh, filed a suit on behalf of those arrested at the Capitol claiming false imprisonment and violation of our first amendment rights. I was arrested that day. As a result, 10 years later, I received a check from the ACLU for $5,000. That money helped me get through law school to, can, to continue my efforts to bring change to this country. I am now 75 years old and my commitment to change continues to this day. May Day changed all our lives. As a note, in 1972, it was revealed that the committee to reelect the president hired um, plumbers to break into the office of the Democrats at the Watergate. At the same time, those same plumbers broke into the apartment I shared with Noreen Banks near DuPont Circle and bugged our living room. I found out the burglars had bugged a lamp in our apartment only after I obtained my FBI files. I still have the lamp. <laughs> Great. Your lamp, my army blanket. <laughs> any rate, um, thanks, Carol. That was added a whole other dimension and probably we should have put it earlier in the program, but it was a very, very useful addition. Um, one of the things that that always raised in my mind in the earlier discussion is biography. I mean, what, how many people who were in the moratorium were then involved with May Day? How many May Day people were then involved with the Indochina peace campaign? Um, how much, how did, We've begun to put on the page, uh, a number of you did respond when you registered with your May Day experience, and I've pulled out the most substance of them and put them on the page. There's also a, a comment box on that page, and, and we'd welcome other people uh, adding their own both May Day experience and how May Day affected them. Um, I, I am noting, I'm seeing the numbers 
we're still at 128 people, but the numbers are sliding and we're, we're now at about 10 minutes of nine. So um, I wanna give us up till nine uh, to continue talking. If people could, could look at the Q&A and if there are any of those questions that you wanna respond to, or if you wanna continue the discussion we were having. Phil, Bill, Larry, LA, Sheila, anybody, Jay? Um, we let's hear what let's hear people have to say uh, in the audience. I'm sorry. Let's hear what people have to say in the audience. Well, you've got the Q and A up there, so yeah, look right. at it. Um, there's uh, there was one question about whatever happened to, and she's on the list of people um, here for the program. Um, And uh, I don't know, looking through the questions, um, somebody asked about walkie talkies, about whether the walkie talkies were provided by the police so that they knew what was going on. I don't know whether Larry, you uh, or Phil or Sheila, you ever heard anything about that story. <laughs> Well, I think Phil's the one to answer that question. There's some great stories, but yes. Uh, might might be uh, late at night for stories, but um, I negotiated a lot with John Dean. Uh, we'd meet in various restaurants and God, he was a real uh, entrepreneur, John Dean. Um, and he supplied us with secret service radios. We had our own marshals. Uh, Sheila has a picture of our armbands. Sheila had sewed armbands for it. It was the Viet Cong flag. It said legal on it, on the yellow star. And it drove them crazy. When I went to the mayor's command center, they gave me my own police officer to drive around in. I had my own police escort. I could go through secret service lines. I had my own passes to the mayor's command center. During the march against death, and I remember I had this secret service radio so I can talk to my marshals and John Dean and secret service could listen to us. We didn't care. During the march against death, Brad Little, one of the, major leaders in planning uh, these for the Mo, uh, was at the tent. We had a tent over uh, near the Arlington Cemetery across the Memorial Bridge with the name of the war dead in it. And Sonny Montgomery, a ra rather large congressman, and in fact, who assaulted someone on the Capitol steps on the, the uh, 5th of May. Uh, but at any rate, th this is a year before. Sonny Montgomery shows up and he seizes all the war dead. And of course, Brad called me and this uh, public uh, radio we had. And I said, Brad, let me call you back on a landline. I stopped the police cruise. I went and I got in the landline. I called Brad. I said, ignore my next communication. I just don't do what I say. And I got back in the car. I said, well, I can't get him on the landline. So I called him on the Secret Service radio. And I said, look, give Sonny Montgomery 10 or 15 minutes. If he doesn't get out of there, just throw him in the river. It's only about two feet deep at that stage. And uh, we have a permit for that tent. You can protect our property. Next thing I know, the man sitting next to me uh, who was assigned me all the time. He was a lawyer with the Department of Interior, and they handled permits for all this parkland. Uh, he started getting calls for it. He was P-17, Park 17, P-5, and then the solicitor and someone else. Then it switched to J-5, who was the uh, Deputy Attorney General for Civil Rights or Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Finally, Mitchell, it went through a bunch of J's, but J1 himself called up John Mitchell and said, is this guy Hirschkopf crazy and what are they doing? And they sent the park police and they grabbed Sonny Montgomery and they took him out of our tent. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful evening and we all then sat down and smoked a joint and just to celebrate for uh, Judy. Uh, but the radios we're talking about, these were secret service radios, basically. We couldn't afford to our own radios, and we didn't care. There was nothing we had to hide in terms of the uh, marshals. Great, thank you. Somebody asked a very specific question who was arrested. This is Lawrence Dworkin. He was arrested on May Day after being at the 14th Street Bridge. He had been told that all arrests were expunged. Was that correct? He wasn't sure and indicated it when he applied to the bar. Do you know where all the arrests expunged? 
for that that day there was a final agreement and the arrest records were destroyed larry have may have more detail on it i uh, i got to know larry he was a guest in my home i don't know for a year larry or how long he was he was here two or three days a week going through all these boxes i have of May Day correspondence and plans and whatever, May Day and all the other demonstrations. Yeah, thank you, Phil. I mean, you were an incredible resource for the book and your files were, you know, a gold mine, honestly. Um, thank you for keeping them and for letting me, letting me have access to them. Yes, on the question on the record. So uh, thanks to the various civil lawsuits that were brought by the ACLU and by Phil's groups and some others, um, the courts ultimately ruled that all the arrests were unconstitutional and that no records could be kept and ordered them destroyed. This was in, I think, the mid-70s, but there were legal battles that went on for years, and it wasn't until, I believe it was 1987, that all of the records, every arrest record, every collateral slip, every photograph taken, any FBI file, was taken down to the big incinerator in DC on the Anacostia River and burned. And uh, so there's no record left thanks to the work of the brave lawyers uh, to recover the rights of all those people who were arrested on in May of 1971. Uh, looking through the questions, but, uh, oh, somebody asked, what the demonstration was that got a third of a million. That was the demonstration that was organized by the National Peace Action Coalition. Um, those of us who are old hands characterize that as the Trot demonstration because the Trotskyists had come to dominate the National Peace Action Coalition while lots of other, and it wasn't, they weren't the only ones obviously in that coalition, but. They were the engine in it. Um, the uh, other coalition that Carol referred to was the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice, which involved a lot of traditional peace groups and Communist Party people and um, a whole array of folks who, in an interesting echo of current discussions, there had been a major, major split within the anti-war movement about narrow focus on the war versus focus on everything, what's now called intersectionality, I believe. Um, and PCPJ represented intersectionality and NPAC represented narrow focus. Um, so that, some arguments never end. Um, so uh, I'm going to give each person a chance to make a final comment before we, it's now almost nine o'clock. So um, LA, do you have anything to add at this point? Well, I really have appreciated the conversation tonight. Oh, is there a little bit of an echo from my weird internet? Sorry about that. Um, Somebody uh, asked where the mountain is. LA. What <laughs> yeah, are you I, on? I respond. I responded in the chat. I'm in the cat skills. Um, you know, I think uh, that this kind of event of of exploring our collective memories of pivotal events like May Day '71 that 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 this is a kind of activism as well. And I want to express my gratitude for all of those who have been preserving this history and exploring this history. Um, I, again, uh, we never really, no one really wanted to touch the radioactive topic of the, 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 the analogies to January 6th, and I can understand that. Um, but I, I do wanna leave us um, thinking about um, the big questions that May Day 71 raises about democracy and its limits and what our recourse is when uh, we have a government that is unresponsive to the people. We, um, I, I would say everyone here is feeling much better about the current government than the one that we had for the previous four years. Um, but these big questions um, are unlikely to go away. We are likely to see um, the issues that played out on January 6th um, uh, 
uh, result in uh, greater restrictions on voting rights that will again challenge us to think about how it is that we preserve the core of democracy by acting um, both within and outside of it. Uh, May Day 71 represents a moment essentially where um, those who believed in the promise of democracy found themselves forced to step outside the established mechanisms of government in order to try to shut the government down. And at this um, perilous juncture that we live in right now, um, I think uh, the lessons are far from simple and I appreciate the nuance that we've heard in the discussion tonight. Okay. Phil, do you wanna say a last? Honey, turn it up. I see, I, yeah, I, I see no pragmatic comparison from the 6th to the May Day demonstration, any of the May Day demonstration or any of the peace demonstrations. Uh, while intellectually you could discuss things, when you look at the people there, the preparation, the motives, what was attained, it's, it's two totally, totally different things. Uh, I, I, I didn't address it because I just couldn't see it. I, I've probably attended more demonstrations than anyone else in this country since Rennie's now gone um, and represented probably 50, 30 major ones in D.C. Okay. Judy, uh, none of sorry, them. I want to... We need to move on. Go ahead, Judy. Do you have a final yeah, wrapping up comment? Yes, my wrapping up comment is that I really learned from May Day that about the importance of being able to use massive nonviolent civil disobedience in creative ways. I didn't know it going in, but I going coming out, I really did. And I think that what LA just said about what do you do when you have an unresponsive government, I think that and I think Black Lives Matter and the, and the demonstrations these days in the streets show the importance of using that tactic. That's what I have to say. Jay? Yeah, uh, I would just say to keep in mind that, you know, voting rights that are now jeopardized were achieved through civil disobedience and massive mobilizations and a combination of all tactics at all levels. <laughs> at the appropriate times. And we need to keep that in mind because those rights are in danger of being lost. And that, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, I'm also concerned that there are currently 90 bills in 30 legislatures that are uh, looking to uh, seriously penalize protesters, including, I guess, in Florida, if you hit a protester with a car and kill them, it will not be considered a crime. So I think we do need to be vigilant. Civil disobedience has been an important tactic. It is going to be encroached upon. So we need to be aware and vigilant. And it'd be nice to talk further about all this stuff, but you know, <laughs> I, I think we've made some progress tonight anyway. Yes, Sheila, to you. I, the only, I guess I just want to say power to the people, but I also want to say that one thing that I'm sure made a influenced was the people, if you watch the movie Crypt Camp, I have, <laughs> I've now become very interested in the disability rights movement, but um, the, you know, what they did, they got us the ADA. They climbed up the steps, of, the steps of cap, the Capitol building because they couldn't get their wheelchairs in. I mean, these people really, you know, and I think a lot of us did things over our lives and will continue to that came directly out of the nonviolent civil disobedience. Carol, do you want to add anything at this point? Unmute, Oops. Carol. Unmute. Thank you. I just want to reemphasize the fact that I had a blast at May Day and I didn't, I was scared, but I didn't care. And uh, it changed my life. And I think everybody who I has, I've talked to that has been involved in May Day said the same thing. We, it changed our lives. We have done amazing things with our lives. And I'm really glad that it went, that we went through it. So there. <laughs> okay, Bill. Well, I wish we had more time uh, to get into the nuances of this discussion. I hope nobody got the impression that I don't have confidence in civil disobedience and protest. Uh, I've spent uh, my entire career helping people uh, 
in both fields, as well as uh, other uh, ways of bringing about social change. And to do that, uh, protest and civil disobedience certainly need uh, to be in our arsenal. And I'm sorry I don't have uh, more time to get into uh, my particular views about May Day, but if anyone's interested, uh, I too wrote a book, uh, published uh, a memoir published by Doubleday 10 years ago called Troublemaker, a memoir from the front lines of the 60s. And in that book, there's a much longer uh, description of my feelings about May Day than I was able to uh, get across in the limited time here. Great. Uh, but thank you, John, for pulling this together. And uh, uh, thank you, other panelists, for stepping up and having uh, a thoroughgoing discussion about these issues. Thank you, Bill. And as I said, you've opened the door for the next three years of our conversations about the evolution and ultimately the victory of the anti-war movement. Um, well, I'll be glad to help you there. Though, though people may have not realized it was the anti-war movement. <laughs> That's who it was. Somebody asked the question on the chat about the effect of ending selective service, which we didn't address at all. And they're trying to bring it back with women also being registered. So that may be another conversation in the future. Larry, I've held you for the final summing up and comments as the author of, oh, and Bill, let me say, if you send me the book info, I'll put it on our blog page so people can get it there too, okay? Larry, go ahead. This was a great event. I really appreciate being on, uh, included on the panel with all, these, uh, with all these folks. And for those of you on this panel who helped me during my long effort to delve into this history. Thank you, thank you again, you know who you are. Um, uh, I would just say that the lesson for me is that we have to really study history and we have to be clear eyed about studying the history that even we lived through or participated in. And uh, as LA said so eloquently, you know, we need to pitch our thinking and our lessons forward as we face another challenging time in this country. Thank you. I am very sympathetic also to LA's opening of this question. And I, I think it's very, very hard for us to do it. But if we can imagine ourselves into the mindsets of the people who were there on January 6th, their sense of an election because of either their ideological assumptions or the misinformation that they had come to believe. They felt as righteous as we were, I think an important, as we felt, and I think a very important difference for social policy and for some coherence in, at these moments of extreme stress is the discipline of nonviolence. That's where the most absolute differentiation comes in that, that those people were ready to kill and that they were, well, we had some crazies amongst us, some of whom may have been in the employ of government agencies. The, that was never a serious aspect of, of our movement and May Day was, as people said earlier, uh, very uh, tightly disciplined, or as tightly as anything could be, but certainly with a uh, cultural assumption that it was going to be nonviolence. So, um, as I say, if you have stories to tell, send them into the comments, or if they're too long for that, send it in to me separately. Um, tomorrow, uh, Claudia Critch is the third person tomorrow morning at 10 Eastern time, along with Nayan Chanda from the Far Eastern Economic Review. Both of them were in Saigon the day the war ended and some time afterwards, and I was in Hanoi on the day the war ended. So um, we'll be showing a lot of pictures. We'll try to not make it just a long slideshow, but there will be a lot of pictures and, and a lot of stories being told. And... Uh, there was a great session done about Dewey Canyon 
several days ago uh, by organized by Notre Dame, um, David Courtright, another part of BPCC. Um, and that's on our list of, of things that are available in video. So um, you could spend the rest of COVID watching our videos if you want to. So <laughs> take care. And if we don't see you tomorrow or, or in one of the later programs, uh, this has produced a lot of, as they say, food for thought about other kinds of discussions that, that ought to take place. And uh, the, the challenge we never succeed in is how to get into the room the people who are doing comparable work in this generation and to, to get some real discussion of what was learned and unlearned and relearned. So, um, okay, uh, so take care everybody. We have gone beyond and we, but we still have held 97 people, which is a tribute to all of you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everybody. Good night.